Hello and welcome. My name is Donna Cryer. I have the honor and privilege of being the CEO of the Global Liver Institute and your host for GLI Live. Um, together uh, today, we have um, the just most fascinating show, one I have been so excited for, which is why I'm just tripping over my words. But thankfully, uh, my two guests today um, are experts in in words and putting words together, particularly to change the conversation uh, about liver disease and liver health and liver patients. Um, so yes, today is patients changing the conversation in liver disease. And I have with me uh, Nora Logan uh, from the UK and uh, an author uh, and a writer and so, so many things it would take like the entire episode if I would just read like all the fabulous things that she has done and been involved in. And uh, Kendall Seesmeyer is likewise a, an, an author, podcaster, a multimedia guru, and I will let you tell, I will let them tell you about themselves over the course of this episode. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me just, let me just bring you in. So Nora, um, tell our, uh, tell our viewers um, about yourself, how you uh, came to uh, this, I, I always say I came to uh, healthcare the hard way through my through my you know uh, experiences with IBD and and liver transplant uh, 26 years ago and the day to day struggles. Tell us about your story and how you came here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here and uh, get to talk about this uh, today. And uh, so I was 28 when I had my liver transplant. And I came to it very in a very uh, dramatic way, I suppose. I uh, didn't know what was wrong with me, and I I was sick for a very short amount of time before I had my transplant. I went away to Indonesia, uh, where I used to live, and came back and thought I had a stomach bug or something, and just was waiting it out. I worked in TV at the time and I had a very stressful um, sort of high energy requiring my 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 presence at all times. And I just was sort of powering through. And uh, through the course of three weeks, um, it became clear that something was seriously wrong with me, but I didn't take myself to hospital until it was, I was very, uh, very seriously ill. And the doctor said to me, um, said to me, you know, you are, you're on death's door and you're in acute liver failure. And uh, I was basically in hospital for, I think it was two weeks before they transplanted me. And it was the day that I had my transplant, there was maybe 5% of my liver left. Um, they did a biopsy after my transplant and they, because they couldn't diagnose me, there was, I, there, I still don't have a diagnosis until today. And uh, there were three cells left in my old liver. So it was, it was this very dramatic, serious situation. And I was very lucky to, to receive the liver when I did. Did you know anything about liver disease before this experience? I did uh, only because it, it, by coincidence, both of my parents had hepatitis C. Um, they both cleared it. And um, so I knew about hepatitis C and ha was very familiar with it. Uh, but beyond that, I didn't know anything. Uh, and, and I had tested negative for every hepatitis. They did about a thousand tests on me um, through the course of my uh, trying to figure out. I was this mystery patient and it was, it was really, it was quite funny actually because I was I was sort of like a celebrity on the hospital in the ICU because they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and every team of doctors was coming in to see me um but they they never were able to diagnose what happened so Kendall one of your uh initiatives is uh we hate it here um but tell us how you got here <laughs> and where here is 
Um, I'll clarify, we hate it here is a um, advice uh, sub stack that I write with my friend um, from college. Um, we were just in the pandemic hating it here as, as everyone else is and was um, and thought it would be fun. So, um, but I actually, my story is very different than Nora's. Um, I was born with a liver disease or I guess diagnosed it um, at like eight weeks old. Um, and had my first surgery right then. Um, and so I was diagnosed with biliary atresia, which is a common pediatric liver disease. I guess of the liver disease is not common for, for children, but of the pediatric illnesses that you can have uh, in your liver, biliary atresia is, is one, of the, one of the big ones. Um, and so I always knew I was going to need a liver transplant. Um, it was more just kind of uh, a matter of time and how long, how much time you could buy and um, until I would actually need that. At that point, um, I was born in 1992, they weren't necessarily thrilled about doing transplants on babies. Um, so uh, fast forward uh, until I was, uh, I was put on the list when I was 10. Um, for hepatopulmonary syndrome, which was like a complication from a surgery that I had had uh, when I was four that was a complication from um, my Kasai procedure that they normally do on um, on babies who are born with biliary atresia. So through a, a wide variety of uh, very rare random occurrences, I was listed and then did not receive a liver on the list, but my dad was my um, living donor for my first transplant. And then I needed a second transplant um, five weeks later, and that was from a deceased donor. Um, so those both happened when I was 11, and I'm now nearly 17 years post-transplant. Um, um, dealt with a lot of complications <laughs> after my transplant for a very long time. Um, but my liver is very healthy and happy right now. Um, and that's been quite the blessing to have um, after such a long time of it being the major problem. Um, it's, it's quite stable. So I'm so glad to hear that. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, I, you know, I was transplanted in 94. So um and was not, although I'd like to perpetuate the story that it was a pediatric at the time, it was not. Um, but they were, it was still in the very pioneering days. So I can imagine even two years yeah. back, and certainly in an infant, um, the conversations and the around that um, yeah. being so difficult. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, I've been was so excited to have both of you as, as guests with your facility for, um, for language and for writing and for you know just communicating um, so many different aspects um, of of this experience um, and we've been seeing more and more patients uh, going onto social media um, in fact using it to um, try to find a, a donor and I'm I was sort of taken aback by that because we certainly I I certainly have been working to. Um, make the system work better for patients. And, and I feel that the uh, having to resort to uh, your, your, your skills and language, your, your media savviness, your, the strength of your network um, to determine you know, if you lived or died uh, was perhaps a little too much to ask of people, but I'd, I'd love your thoughts on um, you know, patients using social media, uh, per particularly to, to recruit uh, donors. Um, maybe Kendall and then and then Nora. Yeah, um, I I do I have seen this experience. Um, I actually have a friend. Um, her name is Tanya Ingram, and she is in need of a kidney. Um, and she put out a, uh, a an Instagram post, uh, you know, saying, "Hey, I need a kidney. Like, is anyone willing to no donate?" Basically, and um, because you know she was told that her weight in LA where she lives would be 10 years. And, you know, as a 28 year old, I think that that's like, you know, staring down 10 years of dialysis, which she was already doing three times a week is devastating. Um, and so uh, I've definitely seen that happen. And 
Um, I think it's horrifying, honestly, like we should have a system that works. Um, and I actually found Tanya uh, through that post and I was working on a story about uh, organ procurement organization failure uh, at the New York Times when I was on the opinion video team there. And so then I employed Tanya's um, amazing advocacy for herself and featured her in that piece along with a couple of other people who are similarly in bad positions. Um, none of them were liver um, necessarily, but um, a, a girl needing lungs for cystic fibrosis and a man in New York needing kidneys as well, who was driving to a new state every weekend to meet with another center in the hopes that he could get an organ. Um, so I, I really think like, there's a gr I think social media is so great for so many reasons and it's really allowed patients to be um, connected to one another, um, to talk about things that they never would have talked about before, um, find like-minded folks um, and advocate for changes. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it, having people um, advertise for, or, you know, for needing an organ um, through Instagram reminds me of the stories of, you know, the community that built the kid a walker out of PVC pipe from Home Depot. Like that to me is not inspirational. Like what 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 needs to be happening is that kid should get a walker um, because that's what they deserve, right? Like, and we shouldn't have uh, this kind of horrible healthcare system. So I think, I don't know if that was exactly what you're anticipating me say, but, uh, and, um, yeah, I yeah. think it's a signal of a, of a system failure, honestly. I agree. Um, I had the opportunity to at least e-meet Tanya and then hear more of her story when she uh, testified before the yeah. House Oversight and Reform. Um, I made that video. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was great. It was and, fun. Uh, you know, patients lifting up other patients um, is is fantastic, and, and being you know blessed enough to be well enough and strong enough to to reach back and and help uh, lift someone up is, is um, you know I, I'm I'm very grateful for for that and and uh, the ability to use our each our our individual talents and, and expertise to bring to this cause um, is is something I point out that we're not you know just patients, you know, they didn't take my degree away when they, when they gave me my liver, um, I still had all those things and can contribute to that as well. You know, Nora, you, you contribute uh, from your work in, in meditation and breath work and healing um, to so many people. How have, um, how has, you know, being able to, to sort of match your, your passions and your expertise with now this lived experience with transplantation uh, played out for you? Well, I just want to say first that I I also know and love Tanya and and she's just such an incredible light and a little Tanya artist. fan club over here. Yeah, honestly, it's, it's, I love that. I'll have to um, send this to her. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, so and you know I had pre having my transplant, I'd always been been interested in meditation, and I found that. Um, through the course of being in hospital, you know, I also had a ton of setbacks and was in and out of hospital um, over the course of um, two and a half years. And even then had, had, you know, it took me a really long time to kind of get to where I am now. Uh, and I found that I didn't have the strength really to to do my normal meditation practice because it didn't feel accessible. And so part of what I do now and part of what I feel my purpose is, is to bring practices to patients who may feel like it's hopeless, like you're lying in a hospital bed and, and you, at least this is how I, I feel, have felt, where I'm trying to pass the time and it would be so helpful to have, um, to have some, resources to to down regulate my nervous system um, and really it was after my transplant that I was able to um, 
access those those practices and it's helped me so much with the trauma that I experienced because there was a lot of trauma that happened just by virtue of being in the hospital and then going through a transplant um, and doing breath work and doing meditation has helped so much to move some of that out of my body and now I I really feel moved and am sharing it with others. I think that's fantastic. Um, I do, I have noticed a trend, at least here in the US, of um, uh, hospitals having um, meditation, soft music, visuals on the TV screens and, you know, in the rooms. Um, sometimes before surgeries, um, they'll give you sort of guided meditation um, that you can listen to. Um, and when I think to, uh, you know, times I spent in the hospital years ago and perhaps just with experience and you know knowledge about what to expect um you know even being in the in the er just a, a few months ago i was like that's okay you know i had audiobooks i was and i'm like i'm fine you know it took hours it was, i was there for like seven hours but it was sort of an easy seven hours versus what i used to consider hard time um you know in in the hospital and i think it, it, i was making it harder in a way just because you know the anxiety and and uh the, you know, not knowing how to navigate the slow passage of, of time um, and the lack of sleep and uh, lots of other things and, you know, coming to it now with a lot more um, tools and, and knowledge, um, you know, it, it, it was much, it was much easier on, on me to go through the same experience without less trauma. Kendall, you're, you're nodding. Are there things as an experienced patient that, that you bring, uh, bring now? Oh, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think the more t repetition you, it starts to become normal, right? Like you do develop new normals and people do adapt. And I feel like after my um, second transplant, I had a complication where I had a biliary catheter um, that I had to get changed out every six weeks um, mm -hmm. under general anesthesia. And I did that for 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd fly home from college. I'd fly, you know, I'd It'd be like every holiday um, I'd go in to like get it done. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, thinking about friends of mine, uh, they talk about like getting their wisdom teeth out as kind of like the most um, engaged like medical experience that they've had. And I think, um, you know, just one of those procedures that I had would probably push them over the edge. <laughs> And, um, and I think that's just like, you know, you, you adapt, you um, start to know how to do things that make everything easier, right? Like, you know how to manage, you manage around the kind of mess. So um, I think that that can help a lot. Um, I think it doesn't take away all of the trauma per uh, Nora's mention. Um, I think that's always, I actually think that, uh, there has been a lack of focus um, around kind of, at least in my experience, an extreme lack of focus around mental health care around like in the experience of having a transplant um, that I think is really uh, a shame, mm -hmm. honestly. And um, I think especially, you know, a couple of my other transplant recipient friends um, from the same pediatric hospital that I was at, like, we talk about this and really are like compelled to say, hey, actually, like this has caused a lot of problems later on for us in life. And it would be really helpful if you guys would, you know, tend to this more mm -hmm. as it's happening. Um, because I think as children, especially like mm -hmm. you don't have any, you don't have like words yet to really say mm -hmm. like, I'm feeling bad, you know what I mean? Or like to know that you could be feeling better. Um, so that was, that's really interesting to me. And I think they'd started to do some of those kinds of like, uh, like a massage therapy or like, you know, just like, or just other alternatives to let's give you some pain medication. Um, when I had my transplants, but I do think that it, it's still, there still needs to be like, there's a long way to go <laughs> with, with all of that. Absolutely. Um, and certainly uh, as GLI tries to determine how we can best set up uh, supports, particularly um, in a virtual environment, 
um, in an asynchronous way, because sometimes it's in the middle of the night when you realize that, oh, you have a question or, or you need to talk to someone to be able to match them with, um, you know, someone of the same age or country or culture, um, you know, so whether you're, you know, you're a child who's going through this, a teenager, um, someone in college, um, someone who's trying to raise kids um, and, and balance this, um, you know, we're, we're trying to um, bring forward a more tailored support um, experience. And uh, I'd love even after this episode to, you know, to get your, your uh, everyone's thoughts and, and inputs on how to be able to do that. You know, I know when I was getting a transplant, they, you know, they brought in a, you know, a psychiatrist and, you know, I was, and then I was like, I'm not crazy. <laughs> right. This is just, I mean, this is a difficult experience. So I, I just sort of threw him out of the room and, and never really thought about it again, but yeah. I, Oh, in talking to the med students and uh, and you know and a, and a dozen other things. Um, I, I watched a lot of episodes of Martha Stewart Living and tortured my parents with all the crafts and things that I wanted to do between uh, the time I home and the time they sent me back to school in my own apartment. Um, but just really destigmatizing it and and normalizing that that you're going to have to find some way to process something that's so big and and recognizing too that. Um, you know, for years afterwards, how we experience the healthcare system is not um, sort of separate or detached from all these things we had gone to gone yes. before. <laughs> there's some sort of PTSD. There's a little like you you can't just come to me and say, um, you know, yeah. there's build some trust. We need to, um, I need to understand things. There, there. You know, it's not. You know, it, it needs to be. Um, you know, in a in a context of of support and recognition that um, yes. you've got even if we come out as well as we have you know ex right. success and the miracle of transplant it doesn't mean that everything is you know rainbows and unicorns and roses um for, for yeah. after um nora i'd love you to come into this conversation yeah i mean for, for me mental health is really a big is something i think about all the time especially in relation to transplant and I had an incredible social worker who helped me so much through my transplant and was this uh, amazing support where I could feel, I felt like I could talk to her human to human um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, doctor to patient, which often it's just a particular type of dynamic. And um, I remember actually at one point, one day I was just, it was, I think I, I don't remember when it was, in like in the history of my hospitalizations but there was one point where I was just so over it and I was just crying the entire day and mm -hmm. I couldn't stop crying and the nurses um wanted to call a, a, a psych consult on me and they did and and th that was fine but I was just I but I found it really funny at the time because I was like I'm just crying because I'm sad because this is this feels really messed up you know yeah because this is sad <laughs> yeah and, and I'm a crier you know and um and it, you know I I find that some of you know psychiatrists definitely there's a place and a need for psychiatry of course and I was really helped by. Um, you know, I took anti-anxiety meds after my my transplant for quite a while, and I needed that support. And um, but but at that time, they suggested that I take a, a sedative, and I just I just found that kind of infuriating because I, it, I was crying, you know. <laughs> and they just so I, you know, make the emotions go away. Right don't have them because they're uncomfortable for us rather than right. like press that and get that out which is so much healthier exactly and and i think then there just needs to be a bit more understanding around trauma in general mm -hmm. in the culture and in in our yeah. society and um and how it manifests and how ptsd manifests and how we you know as as a transplant recipient i i have had a lot of symptoms of PTSD. I, I've, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I have PTSD right now, but I still have symptoms of, of PTSD, and, and, and I manage that. But I didn't have a lot of support around that, or really any, any suggestion that that might be a possibility. I kind of had to figure that out for myself, and I think that's the reality for so many patients. Yes. Um, 
and it's frustrating and there needs to be there needs to be change around it um and just more like Kendall was saying just more support around mental health and alternative therapies you know and just just a, a sh real shakedown of how we approach mental health in general I think <laughs> but I agree yeah. I agree and you know I remember um you know being in that position and and uh envying cancer patients um and oh we've uh, all been there <laughs> yeah yeah we've all and been there the fish tank and the yoga classes and the, and and the, the acupuncture and yeah acupuncture and the specialized services and I you know I know that they um from an advocacy perspective you know that was a lot of work to to get there um you know and certainly now in this position um you know how can we bring that over to the transplant side um and uh, for those of us who were you know so I was in my uh, early 20s when I, when I was transplanted and so you know none of those cool stuff that was over in pediatrics that at least recognized that maybe like something you know soft or colorful or whatever um you know i i was very grateful that friends of mine who were in medical school at the time uh you know their friends of mine from college who were in medical school there um uh would stop by and uh you know have dinner with me or, or hang out or you know share things or friends who were the school of public health there was this long at that point, I'll just use myself with cassette tapes and she, she brought me, you know, uh, now it would be audio audiobooks, but it was her book, it was an, the version of audiobooks in the, in the 90s to, for me to listen to. And just with thinking of me as a whole person and, um, and, and relating to me and, and, uh, you know, reminding me that I was still their friend. I still had their friend. I was more than just a liver um, that, that needed fixing. Um, I was a whole person, uh, you know, who had value and then, and deserved to, um, you know, to have that, to have that support and to be sh in sharing with. And um, so that I, I just, I uh, appreciate that. And it, it was so exciting being back at reunion and being in touch with some of those friends who um, I had, hadn't really seen me since they were in med school and, you know, at my bedside in the transplant. And so to be back running around campus, um, you know, was, as, as they pointed out, it was healing for them uh, as well to, to know that that story came, came full circle and uh, all the worry that they had had and, uh, you know, what they were giving out, it, it was in the prayers that they sent up um, were, were, were answered. And so um, it's been fantastic to reconnect with them now as, as, as adults and, and, uh, to, to have that shared experience. Um, you know, Kendall, you're working to make sure that other kids have um, have great experiences and opportunities to, to support each other. Can you talk to us a little bit about kids caring for kids? Sure, yeah. So um, I'll be clear that I don't necessarily work on it um, in the same kind of capacity as I used to, but I did, um, I started Kids Caring for Kids um, alongside uh, having my liver transplants. And it really started from, I was on the wait list. Um, I watched an Oprah show because where does everything good come from? <laughs> Oprah. Um, and she uh, was highlighting, uh, she was hosting a Christmas party in South Africa. And she then went into some kids' homes and showed how they were taking care of their younger siblings because both of their parents had died of AIDS. And I was 11 at the time. I knew nothing about the AIDS epidemic. Um, but what I saw was kids that were my age taking care of their siblings with no running water and no electricity and no parents. And I was like, nah, -uh, not on my watch. Like, this is unacceptable. And I was actually really mad that no one had told me about it. And on the show, they said, my parents were like crying and I was like angry, you know? And um, on the show, they said, $10 buys a uniform for a kid to go to school. And there you needed a uniform to go to school. And that was something I could understand, you know, being so young. I was like, well, I have $10 and all of my friends do too. Like we do something. And it was at that time, like a couple months later that I was, um, we were kind of proceeding with my dad being the living donor for um, my, what, what I didn't know at the time was my first liver transplant. Um, and uh, I had had surgeries prior and had received so many gifts and flowers and teddy bears and 
um, just knew that I didn't need that stuff um, and that I wanted to ask people to donate to support a, a community um, instead of uh, gifts for me. Um, and so I worked originally with an organization called World Vision um, and found the most highly impacted area by the AIDS epidemic at the time, which was Museli, Zambia. The annual budget for the project was sixty thousand dollars, so that was my goal. And then I just started like, ask like talking about it and asking people to to donate. And then I started to get my friends involved and their friends involved and their cousins involved. And this was like really before blogs or mm-hmm. Facebook or any of that. Um, but I was like updating people on my um, health status through a care page, which doesn't exist anymore. And they were like emailing my, like taking my updates and emailing it to their contact lists, like people who are reading this. And so I started to gain this kind of like readership of my like personal medical uh, Mm -hmm. experience um, because I was doing this other thing. And anyway, long story short, uh, after my two transplants, decided I wanted to keep going Mm -hmm. and we wanted to support other kinds of projects and uh, so apply to be a 501c3 and we're off to the races and um, over the now it's being run by a partner organization um, that we uh, we worked with very closely in in Zambia um, and uh, as, as their kinds of kind of like kids branch but I did run it for for 12 years um, kind of on the side of being like a student and all the other things. Um, and it was a huge blessing in my life because it gave me such a, a positive purpose in a time that was uh, really hard. And I think uh, I had the ability to understand what it felt like to go through something really challenging. And so I think that empathy led me to to, to do that. And um yeah, I mean, it was it was a roller coaster. It was a really incredible life experience. Um, we, uh, I actually was able to go finally to visit the projects that I'd been working on um, when I was in high school, um, because obviously different countries in Africa require certain vaccines that are live virus vaccines that like we can't get. So. It was very complicated, but eventually I got to go and it was um, amazing just to, to kind of like actually be a part of what I had been working towards for a really long time. So, um, yeah, I think it's formed the kind of how I look at advocacy beyond that. Um, I think when I was young, I had wanted nothing to do with um, being a transplant patient. Um I was really ashamed of it, honestly. And um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, you didn't want to be different. You don't have scars on your stomach, that kind of thing. Um, but now I think I take all the things that I learned in, in kind of being, in kind of vocalizing uh, that need. And, and I, uh, now I'm putting it much more towards um, things like the organ procurement organization problem, things, um, other things. I work for the American Civil Liberties Union uh, as my day job. So pretty much all of my life is is geared towards uh, being in advocacy, um, which I think is directly because of my early experiences. I know what it's like to be born an advocate and, uh, and have- yeah can change the direction of your advocacy. I think that's fantastic. And um, Nora, on, on these issues of, of, you know, stigmatization and, and becoming comfortable in, you know, in your skin and, and your transplant experience, you, you've done, seeing, done something really unique with uh, National Geographic. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so a few years ago, I have a friend, her name's Celeste Lerman, she's a photographer, and she does a lot of work uh, with National Geographic and the New York Times and um, other publications. And we just wanted to do a project together on, you know, on body, on the body, basically, on how our, our self-perception of are changing bodies and in relation specifically to my own experience with having a transplant and then having 
uh, you know, having gone from, uh, you know, being on a certain path and then veering off of it mm -hmm. and having a scar. And um, at the time, I very recently had a hernia repair, but at the time I had this hernia. And, um, and so we did this project together over the course of, I think it was about 18 months. And she came with me to medical appointments and she came to, I, I at the time lived in Brooklyn in New York and um, she came to my apartment and we did, did a bunch of photos and uh, she came with me to other appointments. Mm -hmm. And it was a really fun thing that we did together. And then about eight months ago, she's now a contributor to, to Nat Geo. And she asked me if I wanted to be a part of it and uh, be on their Instagram. Uh, and I, of course, said yes, because it, it was, uh, it's not Geo, but also it was such a great opportunity to, to raise awareness around organ donation. Um, and not, and then nothing happened. And then a few months, as these things do, and, and then a few months later, suddenly uh, I start getting a million messages from friends because they have 400 million followers and, um, and you know, um, telling me that I was on their Instagram. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild to have that many eyes on my scar and on my body because I'm, you know, I'm in a bra and, short, and shorts <clears throat> in the photo. Um, but I was just so grateful to, to have that opportunity to, to not only raise awareness around uh, organ donation, but there's, there were so many people who commented on the post that they were so happy to see themselves reflected in an image. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm so happy that our little project that we did for fun as friends ended up being something that was a positive thing for people. I, I you know, I love the statement. And uh, I think I circulated something yesterday with just the phrase, you know, somebody needed this today. Um, you know, you may not know who um, and uh, or where or what they're going through, but somebody needed that um, that day. And so, you know, thank you for putting that into into the universe. Um, yeah, it was it was fun. It was it was it was a good thing that I got to do. It didn't feel like too much. I was like, oh my god, four four hundred million people. That's way too many. But luckily, not everyone looks at it. <laughs> so, you know, where we're coming from, where um, no one really talks about the liver. Um, no, you know, I, I ask people like, where is your liver? And they start going behind. I'm like, no, those are your kidneys. Come back, come back, come back. You know, up, up here, and you only have one, and you can't, you know, live without it. Um, and uh, so it's really big. It's really big. <laughs> Second largest organ, in, um, you know, so 500 functions. Um, and so I, I, I don't think there can be uh, enough conversation about about the liver. Um, you know, it's seven years into the creation of Global Liver Institute. And finally, I can open up the Washington Post and I'll see, you know, hypertension, diabetes, fatty liver disease. You know, um, but uh, it took a lot of calls and persistence to make that happen. So, you know, as as we as we round this episode out, um, how would you uh, how would you encourage other patients to you know start sharing their story or or to reach out in in some way so that we're collectively louder um, in talking about uh, the the liver or at least more effective in in doing that. Um, and, and what do you want, uh, you know, you've worked with premier, you know, publications, uh, New York Times, National Geographic, what do they need to uh, be doing better um, or to know about uh, the liver and, and uh, transplantation to, to make sure that um, people are diagnosed, people are, you know, uh, you know, managed and treated, they do have organ donors available, that there is more attention um, on the types of things that we've all gone through. Um, Nora, and then I'll let Kendall, I'll let you, let you end this. Well, so for the patient piece, I think if there's so much power in sharing your story, I wrote all through my transplant and hospitalizations and I continue to write and it, it just, it allows not only you to kind of, uh, 
parse through what you're going through, mm -hmm. but also it connects you into other people. And I found that throughout um, writing about my illness, but also, you know, just, just in general, uh, sharing stories is such a powerful thing to do. So I would encourage anyone who feels hesitant and it doesn't have to be writing, you know, just any way that you feel moved to share. I think there's such power in collective voices and as much as we can do that and connect with one another, uh, it will continue to grow and there will be less stigma as with anything. Uh, and then I think, you know, I think there, it, it, the question you asked about uh, publications, I think there does need to be a shift when we're talking about liver. You know, I've had so many people ask me since having a liver transplant, mm -hmm. but you weren't an alcoholic, but you weren't, you weren't a drug addict and uh or the question were you an alcoholic or were you a drug addict and that's not there's nothing wrong with with mm -hmm. having had to have a transplant for those reasons right there's a, i there's no judgment that i pass on that but i think there just needs to be more of a conversation in not, not in media and in the culture about there's a million different diseases that you can have in the liver right. it's it is the like you said it's the second largest organ and it's it's the commander in chief and it processes everything so i just think that we need to to reshape the conversation in general around what liver disease is and uh and it's not this myopic thing and and continue to raise raise our voices and hopefully that that will be reflected in media um and I, I aim to do that and continue to do that. I like encouraging. That's this is why I stumbled over the words together um, at the beginning of this episode because that's been the word that has you know just been uh, you know on my on my brain as I think about today. Uh, Kendall, how can we get people to talk about the liver? Yeah. Well, well, first off, I think for the the patient piece, um, I mean we're living in the age of like complete accessibility to tell your own story. Uh, the idea of like social media, the internet being a, a very open entity. Mm -hmm. um, obviously it's not entirely accessible to everyone around the world. Um, but, you know, I think in the context at least of where we're talking, like there's a lot of, mm -hmm. there's a lot of power in being able to have like that tool mm -hmm. um, so easily available to you. And I think I watch TikTok like I'm obsessed with TikTok. <laughs> I am I am a 28 year old obsessed with TikTok, and I'm not ashamed. Um, mm. And I th I find that like people are are just I'm so blown away by all the different kinds of people who are sharing their stories and sharing what makes them unique. And I think um, especially when you're young, I think all you need is to see other people like you or even other people that are just different, right? Mm -hmm. Like that feel different, that seem different. Um, and it's, I just, I, it like brings me a lot of joy to see all of this happening online because I know that I desperately needed that when I was younger. And to, so to see that happening and the communities being created, um, around transplant, around liver disease, mm -hmm. um, all of these things is like so it's so very exciting to me. Um, and I would just encourage people to just start, you know, like just don't don't feel nervous or shy, just start um, because I think it's a really it's a really cool thing. and I think you can also get a lot from it too. Um, and then as far as publications, I think that at least I'll, I'll, I'll talk about transplant at large. I think transplant is not at all discussed. <laughs> I think it's like very, very much, you know, take, takes a back burner to so many other medical issues. And, you know, I think we mentioned being jealous of cancer before. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, my, my friend and I actually have a podcast called That That Don't Kill Me. And it's about health and illness and disability. Mm -hmm. He was born with congenital heart issues and then obviously me. <laughs> um, and so we talk all the time about how cancer gets all the shine. Um, and so I think really, uh, you know, I, I think it does 
unfortunately take people who are being impacted by those issues or know someone impacted by those issues to push for the, that kind of reporting. I mean, the New York Times just hired their first person that's a fellow like to report on disability issues. Like that's, we're so far away from- they, they were, they were, were there just Wild. Like, you know, people, differently abled people before 2021. I don't, right. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then to hire a fellow because no, no, like you can't hire a full-time reporter. Like you can't, I, I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, when I worked there and they had an uh, employee resource group called the healthy times, but they didn't have a disability one. And I said, Oh, this is weird. Like, what about like health issues or you know disabilities and they said oh i guess you could go to the healthy times where they talk about like fitness and clean eating <laughs> it's like ah this is not uh it's just it's i don't know i mean that's my that's the hill i'll die on in general is that i think you know we're being specific about liver disease and transplant but I mean, I would just like to have more shine for disabilities mm -hmm. and health Ill issues of, of all kinds, even. Um, I was wearing a t-shirt this morning, um, admittedly under my Peloton sweatshirt, but um, <laughs> <laughs> because any given day, it depends on, on either beating a personal record or I'm, you know, in the ER. And so um, but the, um, the t-shirt said, if you're talking about diversity without talking about disability, you know, you're, you're missing the story. Um, and yeah. I think that that is a, an important part of being inclusive, um, right. inclusive yeah. of people, with chronic illness, um, you know, who are, who are differently abled, um, as well as other types of, of, of differences, because, um, we can still make contributions. Um, you know, when you think about what you built, you know, from age 11, what I, what I built and how I advocate, you know, from my hospital bed or from the infusion center, uh, you know, nor your, your breathing techniques developed in your, in your hospital bed to, you know, to help others. Um, we're all still contributing and, and changing and changing the world. So I make my commitment to bring more shine to, uh, to liver disease. I drive a, you know, a, hepatic burgundy uh, car with liver lady license plates. Um, so that's that's so that. good. Uh, so You're that, committed to the brand. I like it. Thank you. That's my statement for about stigma. Um, and, uh, and more and more to come. Um, so I'm so grateful for this episode, grateful for the two of you and all of your work and um, look forward to look forward to helping you, you know, spread, spread the word and, you know, paint the word, paint the world burgundy um, and, uh, and, and do this all together. So um, thank you. And for those Thanks of you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. For, for those of you who'd like to find out more, um, including uh, how to um, become a social media expert uh, through our Advanced Advocacy Academy um, and, and other ways, uh, please contact us on Facebook and Twitter at Global Liver and on Instagram um, at Global Liver Institute. So until next time, stay well, stay connected.